And now we are uh, going to listen to the second presentation from our second invited speaker. But before, I will read the CV of uh, Dunja Krause. Uh, Dunja Krause is a research officer at the UN Research Institute for Social Development, or UNRISD, and leads UNRISD's work on climate justice with a focus on just transition to low carbon development and transformative adaptation to climate change in coastal cities. She coordinates a project that seeks to understand adaptation decision, decision making processes and barriers to transformative solutions in case studies of Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam and Jakarta, Indonesia with the objective to inform inclusive policy making in the context of Southeast Asian coastal city. A geographer by training, she has previously worked at the United Nations University Institute for Environment and Human Security from 2009 to 2014, focusing on vulnerability assessments to natural hazards, development of a global risk index, and the evaluation of climate change adaptation options in the Vietnamese Mekong Delta. Dunja previously held a shorter post from 2008 to 2009 with the United Nations Environment Program in Vienna, working on the interlinkages between environment and security and transboundary environmental cooperation as a means of conflict prevention. And today's presentation title is Cities from Whom? Transformative Adaptation and its Potential to Promote Social Justice in Tackling the Climate Crisis. Okay, for uh, Ms. Dunja Krause, uh, the time is yours and your time is until 11.45. So about 25 minutes, it's okay? We'll try. <laughs> okay, okay, please, the time is yours, thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, let me just share my screen with you. Can you see my slides now? Yes. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes. Well, thank you, first of all, uh, very much to the organizers uh, for the invitation to share some of my reflections and insights into this topic of cities for whom. Um, I wanted to note, you already mentioned it, that I'm not a planner or architect uh, by training, but I'll approach the topic with a combination of my own professional background as a geographer and also my current hat as a research officer um, at the UN Research Institute for Social Development. I will speak about broadly questions of social justice and climate change adaptation, which I hope you will find relevant um, for planning as it will speak to the theme of complexity and also the need for innovative design and planning in order to accomplish the kind of transformation that will help us achieve the globally agreed sustainable development goals. I think it will follow also to some extent on the keynote speech we heard this morning from Professor Webisono, who spoke about inclusive cities. Um, but before I start, allow me to just say a few words about our institute and the areas of work, just to give you an idea of where we are coming from. Um, AMRIST, as we call it in short, is a independent research and policy analysis institute that is uh, seated within the United Nations. Um, so it gives us, the UN gives us a normative framing to do our work um, and our mission is to ensure that social equity, inclusion and justice are central in development, thinking, planning and practice. We um, have a focus on addressing emerging and neglected issues and voices in our work and uh, at the on the right side of my slide, you can see our current areas of work um, tackle four issues. So we're a fairly small institute. Um, we can't cover all areas that may be relevant, but we have these four main programs dealing with questions of social policy for development and how that can be transformative, gender dimensions of development, 
social and solidarity economy as an alternative approach to organizing the economy to achieve the sustainable development goals and climate justice, which is the area that I'm tackling. Um, all of our work has to be relevant for the UN and its member states. So one of our key um, recent flagship reports, for example, unpacked the whole concept of transformative change and looked at a range of policy innovations um, that could help achieve the sustainable development goals. Now we recognize that there is a whole range of urgent global challenges that countries are currently facing. COVID being one of them, obviously, uh, many of which are complex and interlinked. Today, I will speak mainly about, sorry, I haven't highlighted all of them. Uh, today, I will speak mainly about climate change, inequality, lack of decent work and social protection, and um, social protection and poverty. So I won't go into all of the details of the climate crisis as an unprecedented global challenge that we will need to address with global solutions. You may have seen versions of these warming stripes that you see up here um, that show annual average temperatures compared to the average over the period from 1971 to 2000. So every year that was colder than that reference period is shown in a shade of blue and everything that is warmer than the reference period is shown in red. Uh, this one that I used here shows the data for Indonesia from 1901 to 2019, which shows us on this really clear path uh, to a much warmer world. Um, the IPCC uh, special report on the impact of 1.5 degrees of warming has alerted us also to the significant risk we are facing if we do not manage to really drastically lim reduce our emissions and limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. And what I wanted to show here is just um, the risk of coastal flooding, which I'm sure in Indonesia you're very aware of, um, which is already in the red zone at 1.5 degrees. So red indicates severe and widespread impacts and risks. Um, this is just to kind of show you the impacts that we are looking at and the reasons of why we as a social development uh, institute um, are also interested in climate change. Um, for us, the scientific background and the issue of uh, modeling climate crisis, etc., is not the main uh, interest point. But we look at cl the climate crisis because we see it as really a defining challenge of our time that risks undoing a lot of the development progress that has been made in recent decades. Uh, but especially also because we understand the climate crisis not just as an environmental crisis, but as a crisis of social justice. Some of you may remember this image of um, an underwater uh, cabinet meeting that the Maldives held in 2009 um, in order to call for global climate action just before the Copenhagen Climate Summit because climate uh, change is threatening the very existing the existence of many low-lying um, islands and areas. Um, Climate change is fraught with this injustice that the lowest emitters um, face the highest risks. Um, but also within countries, we see often inequalities and injustices where lower income population are often more vulnerable and exposed to the impacts of climate change and weather related extreme events than the um, higher income people. Now, on top of this uh, inequality of climate change, we also see that climate policies in themselves can actually reinforce these inequalities and injustices because they often focus first and foremost on the economic or the environmental dimensions um, and not the social dimensions of sustainable development. Now, why then focus on cities? Uh, for us, um, that is obvious, we've heard we're living in an increasingly urban world Cities contribute 80% of global GDP, also 70% of global energy consumption and 70% of global carbon emissions. So cities are on the one hand really um, the places where we create much of our global uh, wealth and income, but also a uh, contributor to the problem of climate change. Um, and at the same time, often portrayed as the front runners in sustainability, because of course, in cities, we do see a lot of effects um, around creativity and innovation. And we see a lot of good examples coming from cities that try to tackle 
uh, emissions reduction, etc. Now, just to kind of um, show you a few slides on the global picture, uh, this one uh, just shows you basically the percentage of urban population for broad world regions going from 1950 to 2018 in the uh, middle and then 2050 on the right. And you can see um, Asia in green here, we're already at like almost 60% uh, expected to go over 70% in Asia. Um, just to show you really again that the entire world is rapidly urbanizing. And that's a trend that's um, unlikely uh, to, sh to stop anytime soon. Now, our project focuses actually on coastal cities. And uh, this next picture of cities by size class of urban settlement uh, projected to 2030 might give you an indication of why. We see uh, that many of the largest cities in the world shown in red here are located along the coastlines. So while we know that climate change is coming and that sea level rise is going to affect much of the coastal areas, we do keep um, growing basically exactly in those locations that are very uh, vulnerable and exposed. Now, um, what we also know is that in pretty much uh, every update of a climate model or of an exposure model, uh, the, the message seems to become more dire and severe every time. What we see here is a study that was done and uh, published in Nature Communications in 2019 um, that estimates the just basically the area that will be below water level um, in, 20, uh, in 2100 um, according to two different models. And you will see um, basically in this darker shade of purple um, areas that were supposed to be inundated based on the businesses, no, sorry, based on the SRTM model that has been used in much of the climate predictions. And in this lighter shade, you actually see how much larger the area will be in many cases um, if we use a more accurate model. So this is actually not changing the assumptions behind climate change and the scenarios for emissions. Um, this is only precision of the model increasing, showing us that much vaster areas are going to be inundated than we had previously assumed. This uh, does also not yet account for any kind of population growth or migration. Um, if we add on top of those exposure estimates, the urban development that ha is happening in the low elevated coastal zones around the world, the picture again becomes more severe and um, threatening. So this top map doesn't really show like very uh, a very alarming picture. But if we zoom in, um, we can see here on the bottom in blue, the low elevated coastal zone. So that's everything that is uh, below 10 meters of sea level and hydrologically uh, connected to the sea. Um, we see that the urban expansion by 2030 happening in red is especially high in um, many developing regions around the world. So on the left hand side, we actually see uh, Miami, which is not um, growing so much in the low elevated uh, coastal zone. Then we see Port Harcourt in Nigeria and Shanghai in China. And there really we see a lot of expansion happening in those low elevated coastal zones. The authors of the same study also estimate that 28% of urban land in Southeastern Asia will be located in high frequency flood zones. So those uh, flood zones include inland areas as well. But just imagine that 82% of urban land in high frequency flood zones. Um, now, of course, we know that climate and weather-related extremes are not the only problem cities are facing. Um, in many developing regions, urbanization is to a fair share informal and unplanned. Um, it is estimated that currently around 1 billion people uh, over, all over the world live in informal settlements and slums. This is data for 2018. And with the biggest share of those, 370 million actually, uh, people in Eastern and Southeastern Asia. Now, what does that give us as like a picture for cities? Um, 
you will have seen images like this. Uh, there's stark contrast often between the formal and planned parts of the city and the informal and unplanned and squatter settlements that are often, especially along the waterways, uh, rivers and canals. This one is an aerial picture from uh, Mumbai. But um, similar images are really um, can be found all over the world. We see here, for example, this really stark contrast between an high-end neighborhood on the right that is just really <laughs> two footsteps and a wall away from a largely unplanned informal uh, favela in Sao Paulo. Now, you can imagine that the lived experience of people on either side of this wall is extremely different from each other's. Um, what we can see in a lot of um, planning is that the visions of those who are behind the planning um, and the lived experience of people living in poverty and informality are fundamentally different. So, of course, in a lot of the planning, what we are aiming for are modern cities, are global cities, are often waterfront cities and centers of wealth and capital accumulation. Somehow, informal settlements are usually not part of these visions. And that makes, to some extent, sense. We don't plan informal settlements, right? But we cannot really tackle sustainability and development if we don't account for these realities on the ground. Um, using aspirational assumptions of economic growth, rising middle and upper classes, um, those developments and plans don't leave a lot of room for poverty and informality. So how then can we actually achieve the 2030 agenda that promises to leave no one behind if we ignore informal dwellers and their often significant contributions to urban economies? You will all know that informal workers uh, have a very special part in all of those uh, cities. They are providers of taxi services, of food, um, of all kinds of services that other people rely on uh, in their daily life. Now, at the moment, I think uh, the majority of uh, planning still clashes quite a bit with uh, some of these realities. And I think it is very important that we come to a place where we can somehow accept the reality uh, on the ground and find a way where we do not simply displace people who are in informal settlements, but actually acknowledge that they're there and try and find a way that works uh, for all. Now, The Guardian actually went as far as calling an urban development project in uh, Nigeria a herald of climate apartheid that will create a green enclave for the ultra-rich, shielding them from floods and storms, while a surplus population scrambles for depleting resources in the surrounding slums. Now, I'm not saying that we should stop planning modern and sustainable cities for the future but I am saying that we have to stop ignoring or downplaying the effects that such planning has on people in informality. Um, Isabel Angelowski and her colleagues analyzed equity impacts of, land ur uh, of urban land use planning for climate adaptation and looked at four types of interventions in eight different cities across the globe. And she and her colleagues came up with this really useful framing that distinguishes two categories of urban adaptation injustices. So she says, uh, in urban adaptation, we can see acts of commission and acts of omission, meaning acts of commission is when planning interventions directly negatively affect or displace poor communities um, through provision of protective infrastructure that basically needs the resettlement of people along uh, the canals, for example. But also acts of omission, which basically omits uh, the visions and the, the existence of poor people by protecting and prioritizing elite groups at the expense of urban poor. So we see that happening quite a lot because, of course, um, economic growth is a priority in many, uh, in many areas of the world. And when we prioritize uh, this growth, we pri tend to prioritize wealthier um, households also centers of co commerce and financial assets over um, the, the informal and poor settlements. Now, I want to uh, zoom in 
on this question, oh, sorry, I want to zoom in on this question of informality and resettlement a little bit more because I think that is something that is really a key issue where we need to basically come up with better and more innovative solutions that are creative and that don't simply displace people. Um, because I think at the moment what is happening is that a lot of plans are aiming to reduce exposure to floods and for those uh, to take place, the informal settlements often have to go because otherwise it's it's impossible to build an embankment system. Um, and they operate on the assumption that displacing people, reducing their exposure, taking them out of the informality will also improve their living conditions. Um, so it's actually better for them. This is often not really based on people's needs. Um, they're not consulted in this. And I think one of the key points is that we really need a comprehensive strategy needed to um, ensure that access to public services um, and social protection are granted in order to also reduce resale rates. So what we can often see is people in informal settlements are being resettled to a relocation site that is far away from their livelihood base um, and they actually end up selling that place or not even building their own um, own relocation house, but just kind of end up in a new informal settlement elsewhere. And that, of course, is not uh, sustainable. Now, um, on the right hand side here, we actually see a project that aimed to do this a little bit differently in Vietnam. It shows a pilot that employed social workers all along the resettlement uh, project that spoke to every household affected and that also took up um, some suggestions of the local people in the design of the house to make sure that it's actually suitable to their needs. I wanted to give you this example because I think it's really important that we question whose values actually inform the visions and urban development planning uh, that are being implemented. At the moment, for obvious reasons, planning is often based on ideas of a very limited number of experts or elites, um, which makes sense again to some extent, because we do need to have experts who inform really kind of who come up with innovative strategies and who inform the planning based on considerations around sustainability um, and modernity. But at the same time, where is the space for social justice concerns? I think we really need to make sure that more voices are being heard, that we actually have a leadership that guides an inclusive transformation process Ms. Klauser, that allows participation. Ms. Krause, yes. sorry, uh, you still yes. have five yes. minutes left, five minutes left. Yes. Okay, that, thank you. That works well, thank you. <laughs> um, so we need uh, to make sure that we have this inclusive leadership, um, bring in people's voices and recognize that even if informal dwellers are not part of our, our vision for the future, they are there and they need to have a space. Their individual strategies and needs need to be respected. They are also citizens and rights holders, even if they're often not recognized as such. Um, that brings me to the whole idea of transformative adaptation. I think what we need uh, to really build cities that are inclusive and for the future, we need not just kind of large scale flood protection measures, but a qualitative shift that can also tackle root causes of poverty, inequality, environmental destructions. If we simply focus on large scale flood protection measures, we will keep creating social problems on the side and we will keep repeating the same cycles that brings people uh, into informality. Now, it's not just us who say it's important. The IPCC, also 1.5 degree report, actually said adaptation pathway approaches to prepare for 1.5 degree warmer futures would be difficult to achieve without considerations for inclusiveness, place specific trade off deliberations redistributive measures and procedural justice mechanisms to facilitate equitable transformation. Now, in order to uh, do that, I want to come back to the sustainable development goals. I think one of the key, uh, this should really be one of, it is one of the key frameworks that we, that is guiding a lot of our work uh, at the moment. Um, and I think it's important to really always come back to the fact that 
even if we're addressing planning or if we're addressing climate change, we are always part of a large framework of uh, challenges and goals. And we need to kind of situate ourselves um, in order uh, to make sure that while we are working here, maybe in number 11 for sustainable cities and communities, we must not uh, basically have our actions negatively influence on the climate change, on inequalities and all of the other goals. I think those it's really important to recognize that they're interlinked and that what we need is an integrated policy framework to be able to contribute with planning and architecture to an overall vision of sustainable development. Now, colleagues at the Stockholm Resilience Center came up with this uh, suggestion that kind of turns our development model upside down a little bit because it um, takes the biosphere as the largest, biggest kind of uh, denominator at the bottom that really gives us the planetary boundaries and the limits within which we can operate. And that embeds both the society in that and the economy within the society. Now, at first, it might not look like anything that is fundamentally different from, ex from what we are doing already. But I think if we do take this idea of an integrated framework seriously, it will involve a quite significant shift in perspective. One that departs from the predominant profit orientation and focus on growth and towards some one that sees economic activities as a means to reach equity and environmental sustainability. So essentially what we're trying to do is build an economy that serves the society and the planet. And I think um, planning and architecture has a really important role to play here because it has so much creativity, it can foster innovations and create kind of spaces, public spaces, open spaces uh, for everyone that are inclusive. Um, in practice, that would also uh, imply that we benchmark policies and plans um, against their transformative uh, outcomes. So we always need to make sure that what we do contributes to economic and political empowerment, to equality and well-being, to active citizenship and agency. So really bring the creativity of people also into our planning and policies. And um, to come back a step again, um, sorry, that was my timer. Uh, that we need to also change global power relations and governance, of course, so that we can actually come to a place where uh, different people and states are on equal footage and where eco-social norms essentially guide our markets and politics. Um, let me just close by saying that I believe urban planning and architecture has a very important role to play as it can build a bridge between public policy and local communities and offer this creative space for innovation and learning that engages communities and builds inclusive spaces. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, first of all, for the interesting questions. Um, I'm not sure I'm fully clear on what, what kind of industrial plant and expansion uh, Latifa is referring to. I think in general, um, that's a central dilemma in, in all of our development planning, right? It's like, who gets to decide what we're gonna do with the space that we have? Um, I think on the bigger picture, making sure that uh, industrial development and cities are compact and that it's concentrated in one area in order to reduce the amount of space that we use in order to reduce also the the transport ways etc that's very important um i think it needs to be decided in each specific instance uh, and i think my main point there will be that there needs to be a, a transparent process that people understand uh, why certain objectives are being pursued and that kind of also is in line with overall development objectives. So I think it's it's not really possible to give a very easy and clear answer. Um, I think it needs to be decided on a case-by-case -case basis and the 
yeah, the process needs to be transparent and it, there needs to be a consideration of what is more important in the bigger picture. Do we like what are actually the gains that we have from concentrating a power plant and, or an industrial plant in one area? And what are the negative consequences in terms of uh, losing space? There was, well, there was first the question uh, on informal settlements uh, that shouldn't be simply displaced. But then, of course, there's this contradiction or tension that a lot of these informal settlements are located in really highly exposed areas and they're flooded, etc. And um, yes, I agree to that. And I apologize if I wasn't clear enough in my presentation. I think I, we do understand that there is often no other option in the long term than uh, relocating these um, informal settlements at one point. Uh, for me, the main point is that that shouldn't just be decided by an expert in place A and then implemented without any further consultation or uh, participation of the people in those settlements. And I think what is currently lacking is a true um, consideration of alternatives. I think at the moment resettlement is almost the go-to option because it fulfills not only reduction of flood exposure but also maybe some of the objectives of building kind of a more modern and kind of beautiful city if you will um, and where we basically just kind of don't consider what the people uh, what people's livelihoods are who are living in those circumstances and I think one way forward um, that we have seen like in the pilot that I showed is to really try and come up with a more consultative process and to try and also find solutions that are in the same neighborhood rather than at the moment in many uh, instances people are being located eight or ten kilometers away from their original settlements and that of course breaks also ties with their social networks with like access to markets with access to work customers etc so I think we just need to come with them up with a more participatory process in order to kind of try and find solutions that are closer to the needs of people. Thank you very much, Ms. Donja Krause.